So for happy jaw joints, we go with a mutually protected occlusion. If we've got buggered jaw joints or problematic jaw joints, we need to use a lingualised occlusion, a bit like a full, full upper, full lower. So basically there what we're going to do is we're going to have teeth touching, again, nothing anterior is important, posterior back, that's what we need, under lines of force. And when we move laterally, we want working and balancing contact. It's about supporting the jaw joints. If you've got dicky jaw joints and you make a, neutral, uh, a permissive splint, which I'll touch on, with a mutually protected occlusion, when we move laterally, they've got their anterior contact only. No posterior contact. If there's no posterior contact, where's the loading going? Straight onto the jaw joint. If you've got a, a dicky jaw joint, you're going to get a, a dickier jaw joint. So when we've got dicky jaw joints, we must have a lingualised occlusion. And again, splints must be stable. They can't rock around. They've got to be comfortable. They can't be making the patient gag. Uh, and they've got to have a bit of thickness in them. So splints, you know, in my book, look, basically they say the thicker it is, the less the muscle force, but at the end of the day, the patient's got to tolerate it. But roughly, you know, I go for about two to three mils uh, in the, you know, the four or five region, you know, maybe. I don't want to go under two mil if I can avoid it at the back because there's a high risk of busting and breaking. The only uh, trouble area there is when we have wisdom teeth. Uh, but generally work on two to three minimum. And if in doubt, do your construction bites and add a bit of meat to your bite so you've got a bit to play with when the patient comes back. Uh, but even if it's a bit out, you can always add to it if it's a hard acrylic splint. So, you know, when I talk about or quantify dicky jaw joint from uh, normal jaw joint, uh, it also comes to, you know, where are we going to take the bite from? You read all this in the textbooks and they say, oh, you've got to manipulate your jaw and you've got to do all... I don't do any of that. You know, these people come in, you can't manipulate their jaw, they're wound up like lackey bands. If they've got muscle pain, they've got spasm. If they've got jaw joint pain, they've got spasm. There's guarding. There's no way you can break that down by manipulating a jaw. Don't waste your time. All I do is I let the patient bite on the splint. When I do the bite, I let the patient bite. When I fit it, I let them bite. I don't manipulate anything. And so with a normal joint assembly, although it is optimal, and remember centric relation by definition only applies to a normal joint assembly, right? So you've got to have a disc interposed between the glenoid fossa and the condyle. If you don't have that, CR is in the bin. There is no such thing. So CR only applies to normal joint position. So the purists will say, we're going to make this in CR and we're going to fit it, we're going to do all of this and you know what, then we're not going to have to do much at subsequent visits. I don't agree with that. I've never seen it. There's still going to be error. So what I do in these cases is we make to what we call is muscular contact position so we let the patient just close up on that. Some people get them to curl their tongue back and all this sort of stuff. Forget it. Just close up, you know, bite. And you just adjust it, get it even. And then over subsequent visits, the muscles relax and the muscles will take me to CR. Much, much better than me trying to muck around with my hands. So the titration end point, again, is when you get two visits over two consecutive... Uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, two visits two consecutive points where there's no change uh, in the tolerance on the splint. Uh, the patient is not experiencing any pain. The vertical range of jaw movement by definition is more than 38 mils and we're not getting any locking. That's axiomatic if we've got happy jaw joints. Right? Now when we've got an, an ab... Uh, an ab uh, now I've put this in here uh, just to correlate now normal jaw joints using mutually protected occlusal schemes. And again I won't go over that but I just want you to recognise happy jaw joints, mutually protected scheme. Don't worry too much about anterior contact, but we really focus threes back or fours back if it's a class two. Then we've got internal derangement, so we've got dicky jaw joints. With dicky jaw joints, no CR, it's in the bin. So what do we have instead? Well, we have what instead what I use a term is median occlusal position. And really all that is, is the muscles develop a space that they want to be in. 
And forget about where the jaw joint is. As long as there's no pathology, there's no pain, it's where the muscles want to be. That's what drives dentistry. But to get to that median occlusal position with dicky jaw joints, we've still got the problem of pain, dysfunction, guarding. We've got to break it down. So where do we start the splint from? Muscular contact position. And then with titration, we'll go to median occlusal position. Does that make sense? Yes? I'll take a yawn as a yes. I agree with that. Right. So then we have our lingualised occlusion. And really the main thing I want you to understand here is we have balancing and working contact. So what is happening is as the patient functions left to right, we've got group working and I've got balancing contact. And that balancing contact provides support to the joint that's translating. So if we move to the right, it's the left that translates. If that's got the problem, it needs support. So balancing contact is very important on the left for right lateral if I've got a dicky left jaw joint and vice versa. And again, incisal stability I don't put a lot of emphasis on. Um, I touch on there uh, what we call joint decompression and this is what Dave McNamara did a lot of work on. And uh, I, I knew none of this, uh, not out of books or anything. And Dave McNamara was the main key, but he, he coined this appliance a decompressive appliance. So when we look at occlusal schemes, really what I'm showing you here is you can see that I have appliances here that I've made where there's no anterior contact, or if there are some, there's no anterior contact. I mean, here's a patient that's wearing a hauli against the splint. Uh, I, I must say I am tending more to cover incisors, uh, only because the bar on the inside, as you can see up there on the left, uh, people play with it with their tongue. So these were, the, these were old slides uh, of some of Dr McNamara's cases. And they, the appliances are always made in wax, like a denture. Uh, these are the decompressive appliance where we've got to get a lingualised occlusion. This is what we use for dicky jaw joints. So when we start to break down jaw joints in classification, you've just got three classifications. You've got arthrogenous, meaning jaw joint. So I've got an arthrogenous TMD, I've got a myogenous, a muscle, or I've got both. A very simple clinical tool is you watch the patient's fingers. So when a patient comes in and says, mate, oh, I've got pain, that's muscle. I go by their fingers. If there's more than one finger, that's muscle. They go, oh, mate, it's sore like this. That's jaw joint. And when they go bilaterally, you run. <laughs> because when... Lee. Yeah, that's right. Only, only, only Lee. But yeah, when you get the bilateral pain, that's usually suspicious of central sensitisation. And they're the red flags. They're very, very difficult patients to, to treat. And by definition, the myogenous cases are often the ones that become the bilateral red flags and they are the more difficult patients to treat. Often the arthrogenous are much easier to treat once you know how. So to try and put things a little bit into perspective here for you, um, when I'm looking at, we, we stage jaw joints, but in very simple terms, there's five stages to a jaw joint. One is perfect, five is buggered, osteoarthritis. Three is your clicking. So we've got a little bit of uh, displacement but we open and we recapture onto the disc and then we close and it clicks right and then we've got fully displaced so we call that disc displacement with recapture and then stage four disc is fully displaced now we've got locking no clicking might have limitation of movement to start with but the problem is we've got bone on bone and that sets the stage for problems in non adapters that's when we're going to get the arthritis so Typically, if I've got a stage 3 jaw joint or a clicky jaw joint, I'm not going to get really inflammation because I'm still landing on that disc when I open. I've still got my cushion. So what we've got to do now is we're looking at what are called stable jaw joints or stable internal derangements as opposed to unstable internal derangements. So then we look at the next one, and this is our stage 4. The disc has just marched on a little bit. And... Uh, in this case, of course, it makes sense, but in these patients, 
we're going to have a situation then where we're going to get bone on bone and in a non-adapter with a lot of force we're going to end up with breakdown, we're going to end up with arthritis. So we will often see inflammatory disorders with the disc displacements that don't reduce more so than the ones that do, that makes sense. And when we look at, when we do get the bone on bone type situations, you'll see here, this is a patient that is a stage three, so she's got disc displacement with recapture, but where does the disc get displaced? Is it anteriorly, is it laterally, or is it medially? It doesn't go back. So here I've got a lateral disc displacement, you can see here with the discs off to the side. And so this patient will get loading bone on bone in certain areas of function, and then she'll start to get some breakdown, and it's just like tooth decay. Just like tooth decay. But what we call is, we call it marrow edema, which is all the white stuff that you see in the head of the condyle, all that white stuff. It's a bit hard to tell on here. Uh, we get fluid, we get effusions, and we get, a, we get erosion. It starts to break down, so the marrow edema is like dental decay. It breaks down the marrow, the cortex then gives way, that's your enamel and that's how the condyles begin to collapse. And we just go through a process of degeneration, regeneration. When does it regenerate? When patient adaptive capacity increases and it degenerates when patient adaptive capacity decreases, which is in line with clenching and grinding. That's at the end of the day the beast. That's what we've got to try and control is the loading. Um, and so here is a, a, an unstable bloke, he's not very happy at all. Stage four, a lot of effusion, a lot of breakdown, and this is on its way to fully blown arthritis. So once you start to recognise the jaw joints, because you need to understand jaw joints if you're going to be serious about making splints, you need to start to look for these little subtle uh, conditions, or at least be mindful of it. You're not going to see this unless you get an MRI or a CAT scan, but you can always get a CAT scan and you get that done through the GP. And you want a multi-detector CT. And you get it done from Perth Radiological, because they're the best. And an open lock we'll often see in the females. So some people will call this joint dislocation, where it just comes straight off its rails. And we'll see this in the females. They're going to be circumpubital. They would have started a contraceptive pill, or they're pregnant. One of the early signs of pregnancy is that. And it's only because when the hormones kick in, all their ligaments go lax, so they can have a baby. And that's why they are prone to that. So now you're through the woods and we'll go into splint design. So, no questions there? Clear as mud? Yes, quick one. Musculoskeletal occlusal balance. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to know um, aside from the splint, do you use other techniques to deprogram the muscles? No. no. So I'm an old dinosaur on ice, and I don't use things like tens. Yeah. I've used tens. I'm not a big believer in tens. To me, the best tool is let the patient do it, and the other tool is time. All of those techniques are largely to do it now. Do it today, get the patient in the chair, let's build them up, work them up. Let's stick all this stuff on their teeth and push them out the door. I don't believe in that. Uh, again, I'm a, a bit old school, and to me, the slow way is the best way. And the other question is, um, I've had a lot of international lectures that have spoken about uh, NPI splits to use uh, you know, temporarily as a deep program yep. before any sort of major reconstruction. Your slide is coming up. I'll come to that. <laughs> All right. So, the next thing I want you to understand now is there are two real two types of splints. There's what we call is a permissive splint, and there's what we call is a directive splint. And a permissive splint means that we are not going to control where the forces go. Uh, we are not going to dictate where the jaw goes. The muscles will. Directive is the opposite. We are going to direct where the forces go. We are going to direct where the jaw goes. Now, here is your slide coming up. So, partial anterior coverage 
equals bad news. I don't like them. And the problem with it, you can say, yeah, I'm only going to do it for the short time, and the patient buggers off and you don't see them until 12 months later. And then they come back with an anterior open bite. Or they come back with a locking jaw joint. And then they're going to say, but oh, you didn't tell me this. So the safest approach with NTIs is stick them in the bin. Seriously, it, they are dangerous things. The number of problems I see with NTI appliances is quite alarming. And, you know, unfortunately, what's happening now is when patients aren't happy, they just Google a website called APRA. And I don't know whether you've had a look at the APRA website, but if you look at their home page, home page says, make a complaint. That's where you're at. So we need to, we need to cover ourselves with this sort of stuff. And we need to limit the potential for complication. And I think you are opening the door for problems by using anterior contact splints. They're dangerous. Uh, I'm a big one for mandibular appliances uh, because we're staying away from the top part of the back of the tongue and we understand that upper appliances can aggravate tongue position. The tongue stays back and then what happens? It aggravates airway and then what happens? We clench and grind more. Or it could be even worse, we might actually trigger uh, an apnea as opposed to a hypopnea. So who's doing who a favour? So you need to think about what patient you're putting these appliances in. So I'm only doing this once I've ruled out the widowmaker, the sleep disordered breathing. Okay, I'm not too worried about the, the meth and stuff like that. Uh, you know, the stress, the caffeine. But I am worried about the breathing issues. Materials hard, patient adults. I rarely make splints for kids. In fact, I can't remember the last time I did. I'd never make a splint for a patient under, oh, occasionally year 12. But I'll show you why I'm pretty reluctant. And I, and I also believe, too, when you understand the physiology of bruxism, it's normal to brux. It's normal to brux in those years because we're growing, we need oxygen. We need to maintain airway and sleep. We have a lot of hormonal change. We need oxygen. We need to maintain airway and sleep. You've got all these chemical inputs. You've got all the stresses. You've got all the bullshit that happens with high school. Um, and so a lot of this stuff is phasic and normal. Just let it work out. It's a different story, though, if they're getting problems. If they're getting problems, we have no choice. We have to treat. And what would those problems be typically? Uh, it's what's called cheerleader syndrome. I haven't put up a slide. You can Google it. But basically what it is, it's anterior disdisplacement in a female. And these patients, I'm a big believer that anterior disdisplacement is also due to mouth breathing. Uh, for the same reason that we'll get compensatory skeletal changes with mouth breathing, you know, you you increase mandibular plane, you increase lower facial height, you decrease maxillary transverse. We just look at what's happening here. We forget about the jaw joint. What's happening is it grows upwards and backwards and that disc now develops in an anterior position. And then when you go through adolescence and we begin to brux, we're bruxing off centre. And then when you add something called a contraceptive pill and a contraceptive pill shuts down oestrogen, which is your body's firefighter, then if we do get inflammation, it takes off and we get very aggressive breakdown of jaw joints. So you only see cheerleader syndrome in females. But females aren't the only ones who, have, who are circumpubital. I can have a circumpubital male and still have an anteriorly displaced disc. Why don't they get idiopathic condylar resorption? Because they're not on the pill. So I'm a big believer that the contraceptive pill, coupled with an active intra-articular condition in a circumpubital female, that is what changes the balance. And so when I get those conditions in a female, I'll write a letter to the doctor and see if it's possible to get them off the contraceptive pill until their condition has settled down. Again, we're not meant to take a pill. All right? So it's interesting how you look at things. So where I tend to manage the sleep bruxism in kids is I look at the causes. So I'm wanting to see kids at five or six. I'm well, knowing the eye contact here. Um, but what I do is, if I suspect sleep airway in kids, I will have them assessed by an ear, nose and throat by five. At the latest, by six. Then they might have an adelotonsillectomy. Then, once the, you know, you might make a quad helix at eight or nine years of age, uh, or I'll just wait and do an RME once the fours are through. And then, 
If they're a class three, I'll make them a face mask because Mithrin did teach me some things. So I can do some of this stuff. And then for Shireen's benefit, I've just tacked in there uh, orofacial myofunctional therapy because I learnt that last Friday. But otherwise, I then wait until there's physiologic improvement. But rarely do I do splints in kids. And when there's aggravated wear, it's not the bruxism, it's usually acid. And the acid is usually reflux due to sleep disorder breathing. It siphons it up, not as a liquid but as a vapour. So here is a reason why I don't make splints in teenagers. Say that last bit again. Yeah. So, so it's a, the analogy is sucking on a straw. So if we've got a bit of up, upstream resistance in our airway and you put that's your finger on the end of a straw and you suck on it, it collapses in the middle. And this creates negative pressure within the eustachian tube and whilst we're asleep, it draws fumes up into the mouth. And whether it goes into the mouth or whether it goes up the nose or both is dependent on the length and the size of your soft palate. So if you've got a big, long, soft palate, it protects the mouth, it goes up the back and we get a post-nasal drip. The nose recognises that we've got acid, let's put the fire out, let's make mucus, and that's your post-nasal drip. If we've got a short, soft palate, it goes into the mouth, and then what do we get? We get the bad taste, the bad breath, and we get the patialism, making lots of saliva, waking up with drool all over the pillow. So these are the little things, again, you start to look for. It's very interesting. But this is a case here where a patient's had an upper splint made in year 11, wasn't well checked, now the wisdom teeth have come through, and now I've got a beautiful anterior open bite. And you know, the crazy thing here is you don't want to go taking out sound wisdom teeth and a bruxa. The more teeth we've got, the better. You know, spread, you know, spread the love, share the load. Now that patient's going to lose wisdom teeth because of having a splint made in adolescent years. So... Really, I suppose what I'm trying to say here is arch versus coverage. Um, I think it's very, very important that we appreciate that full coverage or complete coverage do afford greater stability. Um, we do need to be mindful of full arch maxillary aggravating airway. And this comes back to patient screening. Before you make splints, you've got to be switched on with all this stuff. It's all changed now. Five years ago we didn't do it, but now we have to. And I definitely, if you are going to make a partial coverage splint, it must cover the posterior teeth. Threes back as a bare minimum. No less. And here's my slide for you, because I knew you'd ask that question. I hate them. Put them in the bin. Um, on every tray that I have when I see patients, I have, a, I have a ruler. The first thing I do is I measure their opening. It's the first thing I do. Well, actually, the second thing I do, the first thing I do is with the mirror, I look at the shape of their nostrils. And again, that was in my talk last year. The second thing I do is I have my ruler and I'm measuring their opening. And the, the other thing that I'm going to measure here is uh, basically what we've got to do. I'm not worried about measuring the sideways. I just want the vertical. If it's less than 35 mils, that's a red flag. If I've got deviation on opening, that's a red flag. If I've got any history of closed locking, Doc, occasionally I just can't bloody open my, my door, my, my jaw. But yeah, it's occasional, but not all the time. It's still a red flag. Even if it's happened once, it's a red flag. And palpatory joint discomfort. Get in the habit of pressing the jaw joints, getting them open and closed. Stick your finger in their ear, open and close. Is there any pain? Don't just look at your masticatory muscles. Remember the jaw joint. So when we look at permissive splints, lots of different types. I'm not going to go through all of these. A lot of this stuff you're used to. But I just threw that slide in because I'll often make them for patients with dentures. That's a real easy one. And you could use the splint just to work out what vertical you're going to make a denture to. And the gelb splint. I mean, that's a very old-fashioned one. I still use that occasionally. I'll use that for the gaggers. Um, but the main thing with permissive is... <coughs> The indications, they're muscle-based. We're making them for people with myogenous, not arthrogenous, typically. And they can be made for arthrogenous, but that must be verified with a CT scanner and MRI. If you can't be sure, if in doubt, go a directive splint. If there's any open locking, I'm quite happy to make a, 
a, a, a neutral or a permissive splint, that doesn't worry me. Because remember in an open locking, the jaw joint is okay, they've just got uh, lax ligaments. And that's something that's going to come and go a little bit. Clicking. I'm quite happy to make them a passive splint if they've got clicking, because we can have clicking and have normal jaw joints. The only way you can verify what is happening with a jaw joint is with an MRI. And a lesser variant is a CT. But uh, MRI is gold standard. Uh, so clicking, I'm happy with that, so long as there's no closed locking. And again, what does a splint do? It's going to help me with the dental care, all those earlier things I was talking about. It's going to help me find that stable musculoskeletal position over time that I can then mount up and I can then look at restoring this patient with an organised occlusion as opposed to a conformative occlusion. But if you do make a splint, a neutral or a permissive splint in patients with clicking, warn them that it may be possible that they could have anterior disc displacement and it may be possible that as the muscles relax through wearing the splint and in lateral movement I've only got anterior contact, no posterior, the mutually protective occlusion, I have no support for the joint. If I've got an anterior displaced disc and I start to load that joint, I'm going to stretch the ligaments. I could sever the bilaminar zone at the back and whammo. And now I goes to a closed lock. The number of patients I see with closed lock because they've had neutral splints made, I would see half a dozen a month. And they're not happy people. And you have done this because you didn't know what you were doing. The patient probably would have been fine had no treatment been provided. So unstable arthrogenous TMD or locking, we do not make a permissive splint. When do I use them? I use splints pretty routinely, always in control phase. Now everyone here is different. Again, I'm a bit old fashioned. I use splints early, so I'll implement them in a control phase. Um, I will always get um, an OPG as a baseline, always. And that's what we call as an Axis 1 assessment. So when we're assessing patients, Axis 1 is the physical stuff and Axis 2 is the non-physical or the uh, psychosocial aspect. Axis 2 we must have if we're looking at or is serious about treating patients with um, uh, arthrogenous problems or chronic myogenous problems. The records, alginates, I don't worry about rubber base or anything like that, alginates, but I pour them up. I don't leave them out the front for the lab to collect. I pour them up with my vacuum mixer and my Yellowstone and I pour them up straight away. And I do that while the girl's changing over for the X-plate. So those alginates don't sit around. And the other thing is you don't need a face bow. Um, and we'll just take our bite, I'll show you how to do the bite. What do I use? I often use clear splint. Why it's easy, it's a bit cheaper, I can soften in hot water. If they get out of the habit of wearing it, no big deal, run it under hot water, readapt it. It's a good, easy tool. But again, mutually protected occlusal scheme. It's flat, there's no dimples, it's like an ice skating rink because we want directional freedom. We want the muscles to be able to move the jaw where the muscles want to go. We do not want the muscles to be dictated to by divots in that splint. That is really important. Sufficient thickness to provide strength to the material and to relax musculature. And again, reduce bulk, respect the tongue. And if they're really bad gaggers, I make a gelb splint, only because it's a little less bulk. So there's my bite. That's all I do. Okay? Don't take two alginates and send it to the lab and make me a splint. You're wasting your time. You've got to do your bite. So who here would routinely use leaf gauges for their construction bite for splints? Well, there's one thing you got out of tonight. Do that. That's easy. All right? And those things, the Huffman leaf gauge. Showing my age, but you can get them from uh, Palace. Then, the next thing you've got to do is you've got to communicate well with your lab. Don't just make splint because you're just going to get crap back. So you need to, I will always tell this lab what I want. So here I'm telling them. There's no grey area and if it's not what I want I just send it back. You know I want a flat occlusal plane, I want point contact, I want bilateral premolar ball clasp retention, I want group working on eccentric disclusion. 
But again, simple analogy, rubbish in, rubbish out. Um, the protocol. I spend 40 minutes issuing a neutral splint. Now, it amazes me how I see some people and some patients will say, you know what, I can't believe how much time you've spent mucking around with that. The last one I had, he spent 10 minutes. You've got to, if you want patients to wear splints, you've got to attach value to it. If you're going to charge a patient 600 bucks for a splint, then make it worth the patient.